Welcome everybody to the Morning Swim Show for Friday, April 27th, 2012. I'm Jeff Cummings here with Tiffany Elias as we've been here all week on the deck of the Phoenix Swim Club where the Canadian Olympic team is training, getting ready for the Olympics. And as you may have remembered from the Canadian Olympic trials, a lot of great stories coming out of them and we got a chance to interview a few of them and we're going to talk about some of those today. What do you think is one of the bigger stories, Tiffany, that come out of the Olympic trials? Jeff, by far one of the biggest stories has got to be the 200 breaststroke on the ladies' side. Canada has two ladies that have qualified, Martha McCabe and Tara Van Bylen, both beating the world record holder, Anna Mae Pierce, at trials. Uh, big upset, um, but you had a chance to talk with both of those ladies about their training with Anna Mae and, and qualifying. Yeah, it was a really good interview I did. Let's check out some of that clip. I'm here with two of Canada's best breaststrokers in the world, Martha McCabe and Tara Van Bylen. Thanks for joining us, ladies. So. Uh, First Olympics for both of you. What's the what's the excitement level for you right now, Martha? Uh, pretty excited. I mean, I have I have been to other international meets, but I've only heard amazing things about the Olympics, so it's pretty exciting right now. And Tara, I mean, this is you know has to be kind of a whirlwind thing for you. You know, tell us tell us what it's like. I mean, you're going to be swimming 100 and 200, so you're going to mm -hmm. be pretty busy. Yeah, well, this is my first um, senior A team, actually, so it was incredible to make my first A team as the Olympics. Um, I'm super excited, um, and to have two events, it's even more incredible, so. Well, Tara, tell us about that Olympic trials. I mean, going in, did you did you have a realistic goal of making the Olymp Olympic team, was, or was it just kind of like, we'll just see what happens? Um, I think a couple months um, before the trials, I kind of thought it was a, a goal. I didn't know if it was reachable, but getting closer and closer to the meet, um, I was feeling a lot, a lot stronger in the water, um, a lot more um, focused and prepared. And the prelims of the 100 breaststroke, I felt pretty easy in the water, and I, I knew that it was going to be a good race in the, at the, the finals. So, yeah. And Martha, you've kind of had eight months to kind of prepare for this. I mean, you were pre-selected for the Olympics after winning the bronze medal and the 200 at World. So tell us what it's been like for you these past eight months, knowing that I guess you're, you're on the Olympic team already. Yeah, so it's, I've been thinking more about the Olympics than I was thinking about Olympic trials. But at the same time, I wanted to post a good time at Olympic trials. It's important to get at least one fast swim out before... Um, going to the Olympics this summer, but like I said, um, in the back of my head, it's, it was all about this summer, and it is still just building more and more about this summer. Well, another interesting storyline on the boys' side is David Sharp, who is the first male to qualify for Nova Scotia. You also talked to him as well. Yeah, really good story. Not just uh, first male qualified for Nova Scotia. He barely made it to the final of the 200 fly, and then um, had a great race beating out the national record holder Stefan Herniak. Here's what he had to say. I'm here with David Sharp, who made the Olympic team in the 200 butterfly for Canada. David, I understand you had a pretty uh, kind of, I wouldn't say uh, close call, but uh, one of the most memorable races in the Olympic trials out in lane eight in the final, barely made it in. Tell yeah. us the story of, of uh, getting into the final and then making the Olympic team. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I should have been in lane eight. I should have been seated a little higher than that. But uh, in the morning, I was, I was so nervous. I was trying to calm myself down. I think I calmed myself down a little too much. So in the morning, I just sort of went easy. And uh, like the race wasn't hard, but I just, I barely snuck in, I came eighth. So I knew in, in finals, I knew I could go a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And then uh, lane eight, yeah, make, makes it look cool, but you know, I think I should have been lane four, lane three, not lane eight. So uh, this wasn't your first Olympic trials though? No, yeah, I, I went four years ago and I came uh, 16th in 100 fly, I was 17. That's not too bad. We're actually a big jump up. Yeah. So it wasn't your first Olympic trial, so it wasn't the nerves. Were you just, was it still just kind of, you know, it was a prelim swim, you didn't want to go out too hard kind of thing? Yeah, I was, I was sort of trying to just finesse the race and, you know, keep it controlled. And I don't swim very well like that. You know, I just, I need to attack the race and really go for it. So at night, I just, you know, I went by... Uh, my 50 split in my 200 was 0.1 off my best 50 time. I just, you know, I went out and I, it paid off. That's pretty good. So tell me about that final race. I mean, every, every turn you're turning and you're seeing, you know, your head and, you know, what, what's going through your mind. Yeah, on the, well, on, the, on the 50 I was first and I saw that. So I kind of backed off a bit on the second 50 because I knew I had some room to play with. Um, and then at the 100, you know, I was still in the mix. Off the, off the last turn, I saw that it was me, uh, Zach Chechet, and Stefan Herniak. We were all pretty close. So, 
you know, after after the last turn off the underwater, you can't really see anything. So I just, you know, put my head down and went. What was it? What was it like for you to be able to have beaten the national record holder, Stefan Herniak? I, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Um, the time, you know, if, if somebody had told me before the race that that time was going to win, I wouldn't have believed them. I would have sort of thought they were crazy. But it wasn't a, you know, I, a lot of us in the race thought it was going to be a lot faster. But hey, I'll take the win. Now, the thing I love about David's story was that he said, had you told me that time would have won, I wouldn't have believed you. That just goes to show anything can happen. You just got to make it back. And a great story and, and great experience there for David. Absolutely. And then another great story is uh, Ryan Cochran, who's one of Canada's big metal hopes in the 1500 freestyle. You know, he didn't have to really put any any big effort into Olympic trials because he was pre-qualified based on his performances at World Championships. But, you know, the big story is his race with Sun Yang, and here's what he had to say about that. I'm here with Ryan Cochran, 2008 bronze medalist in the 1500 free. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So uh, here in Phoenix, tell me how training's been going for you. Well, it's a little nicer than right now in Canada, pretty much yeah. anywhere. Uh, you know, coming in the sun and getting the team together, I think, is what we really need to do as our national team right now. And, uh, I mean, great facility, great weather, and uh, it, it's been some great training. I've been keeping watching your training all week, and it kind of seems like the guy you've mostly been training with, Alex Page, the guy who you train with every day. So it's kind of like, I guess, not really anything new for you? Uh, you know, the change, the group changes a little bit. Uh, at home, we have a lot of guys who kind of go 15, 30, and there's, there's a good group of kind of up-and-comers, and here it's a totally different mix of people, but I think it's good to kind of change the focus a little bit, but, you know, it's, it's always about fast swimming, so it doesn't really matter who's in the lane beside you as long as they can push you a little bit. Right. So how does this Olympic team um, differ from the one in 2008? 2008, uh, you know, we knew going in that we were, it was a building year. And, uh, they talked about the team being so young and uh, it wasn't going to be our games because, you know, four years down the road, it's, that's when it's going to get really great. And uh, it's funny because I think the team's just as young this time around, but uh, we're not really on the building phase anymore. And I, I think it's fantastic that we can talk about really pushing to make finals and pushing to make the podium more than one time. How does it feel for you to, you know, you're, you're just 23 years old, but you're kind of the veteran of the team, the one that everybody looks to. How do you feel in that kind of a role? It's a little crazy. Uh, I remember uh, four or five years ago, they started calling me a veteran, and I wasn't even 20 yet. And it just, it was a crazy thought, but I had been on the national team for a couple of years, and uh, especially, you know, into 2008, there was a lot less uh, seniors on the team, and they, they needed uh, someone to be a leader, and I chose to be a leader by example, less than, you know, by talk. And I think this time around, it's, I'm able to, you know, articulate what I want to see in our national team and really hopefully push the team that much more. So is this kind of one of those things where someone came up to you and said, you've got to be a leader? Or was this kind of a natural progression? A uh, bit of both. I think, uh, especially after our trials, seeing who's on the team, knowing that, uh, I mean, Brent, it's going to be his third games, but there's not a lot of experience past people who have been to one games. And I think uh, I really relied on Rick Say uh, in 2008, asking him questions, and he'd been around for years and, you know, kind of knew how to talk you into what the village was going to feel like, what the pool was going to feel like, the, the nerves and all that. So uh, it's, it's weird, you know, I'm taking on that role now, but I'm happy to be doing it. Well, let's talk about the, the big elephant in the room, that 1500 free in London. Um, you know, we always talk about it being one of the races that we're all looking forward to. Would you say that, you know, this has become a, a big rivalry between you and Sun Yang? <laughs> I think it, my rivals seem to change year after year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always kind of in the final, but it, it just, every year it's a different Chinese character, it seems. But uh, I think it's an exciting time to be swimming distance, and uh, he's really pushed the event. And I think it's about time someone broke uh, Grant's world record. And uh, it's funny thinking back on, you know, people said that swim was unbeatable and how great Grant was. And I, I don't want to take away from that because he was a fantastic athlete. But uh, I think if we can have three or four guys that really push that, that swim, it'll really, you know, get the event going faster. And uh, I mean, I've been asked so many times recently if, if I think Sun Yang's beatable. And uh, I mean, I don't really know why you'd ask me that question. Absolutely, I think he's beatable. And I think uh, it's going to be interesting this summer because we swim a race is completely different. And, uh, you know, it'll be very different dynamics. And especially now that we know what to expect yeah. from one another, okay. I think it'll be, it'll be exciting. Well, there's got to be a lot of pressure on Ryan because Canada is really relying on him to be one of their main medal contenders. And he's got a, he's got high expectations and Sun Yang really setting that bar high. We, we discussed earlier, he's really a favorite for that silver, but there's got to be a lot of pressure there on, on his performance and his training. Yeah, he's been training hard here in Phoenix. I've seen some of the workouts he's done and 
just the determination to uh, to know that he wants to race for gold and not for silver is really important. And um, all these guys, I mean, they just really want to swim well. And, and uh, one of the things that they're doing here is doing a lot of great uh, dryland training. I got a chance to talk with their strength coach, Eugene Liang, about some of the things that they've been doing here in Phoenix. Eugene Liang here with the Canadian Olympic team training at the Phoenix Swim Club. Eugene, thanks for joining us today. No problem at all. So you've got many titles. Tell me what, uh, what you do full time. Uh, I work for the Canadian Sports Centers and I'm dedicated to swimming. And basically what I do is I organize and manage the integrated science team. And then on a service provision side, I'm a strength conditioning coach. I do the design and implementation of their strength program. And I uh, do therapy as well, just to make sure that they're handling all the work. Well, we'll talk about the integrated science part in a minute. But in terms of strength and conditioning, this yep. team, I mean, they're all they're coming from many different places, not physically, but just like some of them did a full taper for trials. Some of them Absolutely. Um, had the luxury of not doing a full taper. And so they're coming here in different kind of conditions. How do you kind of manage all of that into, you know, this big group? Uh, we're pretty lucky in Canada. We have a bunch of sports centers and a bunch of great sort of integration between all the sports centers. So I usually just get all the programs from all the other strength coaches in Canada that are working with the carded ath uh, athletes and the swimmers that make the Olympic team. And basically I get to sort of deliver their program. So there's no real uh, disconnect and uh, and that way the athletes are given uh, a, a continuation of what they need to do all the way into the prep. So there's been a lot of communication before Absolutely. they arrived here. Yeah, well, that's sure. really cool. So tell me some of the things that have been going on in the waiting room with uh, these guys this week. Uh, on our side, because I can speak on our program on the West Coast, we basically share between the two strength coaches, another guy named Cam Bertwell out of Victoria. And we focus a lot on just sort of explosive power and sort of base building of strength right now because they're coming off the trials. So we've been doing a lot of uh, just sort of Olympic lifting, uh, power tower work in the water. If that, I mean, we integrate the swimming and, and the dry land. We've been doing a lot of just standard strength building and a lot of sort of stroke mechanic stuff that we've been working with our biomechanist uh, bio Alan Wrigley. Uh, how long have you been working with the uh, sports performance centers? Uh, fully for about six years, been on contract for about 13 years now with the Vancouver Swim Center and then moving into the Canadian Sports Centers as an integrated group. And how has strength training as, uh, as it holds with swimming changed over these past you know, decade or so? Uh, it's funny because I just had this conversation with the coach. We've noticed, especially in the last four years, a huge jump in the integration of sport, I mean, strength into the sport. Uh, for example, uh, 2008 in the staging camp there, there weren't a lot of athletes sort of uh, strength training into the prep of the Olympic Games. And we've noticed everyone's on a different strength program now, but that almost, I would say, 99% of the athletes are into a, an intensive strength conditioning program. It's pretty interesting to see. All right, so that's going to do it for today's edition of the Morning Swim Show. Join us here on Monday. We're going to have Julia Wilkinson join us, one of the most personable um, swimmers on the Olympic team to kind of give us an overview of how this training camp went and just talk about her own Olympic aspirations. So for Tiffany Elias, I'm Jeff Cummings. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.